I just want to find 11,780 votes. The Fulton County Grand Jury investigation of Donald Trump. What proves fact A, fact B, and fact C? If we can do that, I'm going to bring an indictment. I'm Bill Rankin. I'm Tamar Hallerman. Join us for season nine of Breakdown from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Listen now, and please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Happy holidays, everybody. For lots of Mexican-American families in Texas, Christmas is celebrated with tamales, often homemade ones. Today, I am talking with Chef Edan Medrano, author of the cookbooks Texas Mexican Cooking and Don't Count the Tortillas. He spent more than a decade celebrating comida casera, the kind of home cooking that he grew up with and whose traditions stretch back for hundreds of years. It's Wednesday, December 21st, 2022. I'm Lisa Gray, and this is CityCast Houston. Anand, thanks for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Oh, I've wanted to talk to you about this stuff for years. So you have devoted yourself to what you call Texas Mexican food. It's not the Tex-Mex queso and fajitas stuff that we know mainly from restaurants but home cooking by Mexican-American families in Texas. For lots of those families, Christmas is a really special time, and it's celebrated with tamales, often with a tamalada, a big work party to assemble them. What is that like? The tamalada is a a wonderful memory from my childhood, and uh, the idea, or actually the image, of Uh a cold day, the neighbors from across the street and uh, in the backyard come over to help chop the the meat of pork or beef, oftentimes beans. Actually, we use bean tamales, uh-huh. and um, it uh, the tamal joins you to the family because it's such a labor intensive uh, task. Uh, you need a lot of people to to be helping you, and so there's a lot of conversation, uh, a lot of uh, very juicy gossip sometimes that. Uh, <laughs> One prizes. <laughs> Whatever uh-huh. happens in a tamalada stays in a tamalada, as we say. Uh-huh. So a tamalada really is a community and close friends coming together and spending an afternoon and evening making tamales. Tamales are mm-hmm. tie us to this land, the land of Texas, the ancient land of Texas, to the USA. And also it, it asks us to use flavor as a way to bind us to our friends brothers and sisters across the globe, not just those close to us. So I think of a tamal, which many of us in English pronounce tamale, but a tamal is some core of a filling, the meat or the, sometimes I've had sweet ones at Christmas, and around it is a sort of layer of masa, of corn with lard or other, you know, delicious fat, wrapped in a corn husk. Um, It feels very much about corn. Is that something that ties you directly to that ancient tradition? It is definitely about corn. And corn uh, arrives in Texas in 700, the current era, from Mexico. Mm -hmm. Uh, Corn is a uh, woman-made product. Oh, women grow it? Yes, it's a woman-made product. It it, it comes into being about 7,000 years ago, invented Uh by uh, indigenous women in Mesoamerica, who take a, a rice type of grain called teosinte and uh, make it through their processes of growing into corn. And corn does not exist in the wild mm-hmm. by itself. It needs human intervention. And we say it's, it's, it's a women-created product because we know that 7,000 years ago, even through today, in the Native American communities of North America and South America, women are in charge of cooking. Women are the engineers of all the cooking technologies that we use today, smoking, baking, roasting. Mm -hmm. They engineer those technologies as well as develop the flavor profiles that we use today. So that's why we know that corn is a woman-made product. And Mm -hmm. I think that tamale asks us to do two things when I enjoy a tamale. Let your taste guide you to, it's not just flavor delicious, it's intellectually delicious. (laughs) By that I mean, if you look at where tamales are rooted, you realize that they're rooted here in Texas thousands of years ago. Not just in Texas, but in Chicago, 
Missouri, and Virginia. Mm -hmm. But in, uh, for example, if you go to the uh, Hopi traditions in Arizona, for example, they have tamales. They've had tamales for hundreds of years, as they have in Mexico. So it's not it's not something that came from across the border. It's something that over hundreds of years, thousands of years, emerges from the civilizations of North America and Texas being in contact with the civilizations of Mesoamerica and Mexico. In 1612, in Virginia, Captain John Smith has in his diary a mention of tamales. He he describes, he says, the corn they roast and and bruising it in a mortar Uh of, of wood with pelts they, they they wrap it in rolls of leaves of corn, and so they boil it. Even in Virginia, John Smith knows that the Native American peoples of, of the United States are making tamales. Wow. It's not just mentioned in John Smith in Virginia. It's mentioned in the Caddo people here in Texas. You know, the Caddo are the Texas people, mm-hmm. T-E-X-A-S, Texas. X is, when you, when you read it in Spanish, as you know, it's pronounced like an H, so it's Texas. Uh-huh. They were making tamales. And we know this from diaries of, in 1691, a Spaniard named Casañas says that the Caros received him. They took out a bench. And um, he says they have very good food like calabazas, which is squash, watermelons, and sunflowers. And then he says uh-huh. the seed of all of these mixed with corn make very fine tamales. Oh, wow. So so from the very early diaries and historic writings of the Spaniards, we know that tamales were already here because uh-huh. uh, Mesoamericans from uh, Mexico were in constant contact with Houstonians, you know, our, our ancestors. So that's what I mean by intellectually delicious. It's just so wonderful to taste a tamal and realize it's been in Texas for hundreds of years, and they're the product of our native ancestors. I think that's very beautiful. I love that. And it's such a great way to celebrate a family holiday that stretches back. Could you talk a little bit about how Texas Mexican cooking is different from Tex-Mex? Thank you for the question. That's a, that's a very important question that uh, arises. For example, when the New York Times mm-hmm. did a story on my work and uh, they featured it as the front page story of their food section, the headline was "Don't call it Tex-Mex," <laughs> and and some people took offense at that. And and my point is, to make a distinction does not mean to disparage. It's simply to make a distinction. A lot of my friends like, uh, and I go out for margaritas and and uh, f- fried f- uh, foods. Mm-hmm. There are with uh, na- uh, lava like mounds of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not Texas Mexican food. That's Tex-Mex. Be- it begins to be called Tex-Mex mm-hmm. uh, around 1970s when food writers uh-huh. coined the word from the Texas Railway, the Tex-Mex, and applied it to this food. But unfortunately, they applied it to the food, which was a- an imitation of Texas Mexican food. By Texas Mexican food, I mean the home cooking of Mexican American families whose ancestors go back to the first people of Texas. So that's that's a history that goes back 15,000 years right. here in Texas. That's comida casera because uh, like mine, like my Mexican-American family, we did not come f- from across the river and our food did not come from across the river. Our food was north and south of the Rio Grande before it was a border. And so the the Texas Mexican taco that you have in Brownsville, Texas, for example, will be the same taco that you have when you cross the bridge and you're in Matamoros. It's the same food, and I like to celebrate that unity. the The bottom line is, mm-hmm. if you look at it this way, where it it's not just Mexican American families, but it's all Texans. If you're a Texan, you are celebrating an ancient state with an ancient history, and tamales are part of all of our traditions. It didn't come from anywhere. It's our Texas tradition. People who are not familiar with the traditional Texas Mexican food are most likely to encounter it in a restaurant. What are some restaurants where they could find it, where the food served is not Tex-Mex? Thank you. Thank you. It's so important that you mention the restaurants because Tex-Mex is... Tex-Mex is a uh, uh-huh. restaurant tradition. Mm-hmm. Tex-Mex imitates the home cooking of indigenous Mexican-American families. The very first uh, time 
that the home cooking of Mexican American families expands from our community into the public sphere was the urban center in San Antonio, Texas. And in that urban center, uh, indigenous Mexican uh, women had stands that they called their puestos. And they cooked uh, uh, chile con carne, enchiladas, and tamales. And uh, the tamales didn't have any cheese on them. Yeah. And based on that success, Anglo people who had access to capital were able to open their restaurants using capital from banks to build a mortar uh, and a brick restaurant. The women didn't. All, all the women had, because they had no access to capital, was their open air stands. But their food was the draw. So these Anglo people who were able to make the re- indoor restaurants took over. Mm-hmm. They couldn't exactly mimic the flavors, but they tried. And a result of that is the cheese-laden fried foods that we enjoy as Tex-Mex food. And so I would say some of the very, very famous uh, Tex-Mex traditions are cheese enchiladas with lots of cheese. Actually, any any plate with lots of cheese on it. <laughs> so that that's Tex-Mex. As, as, if you compare that to me- Texas Mexican, there are two main differences. Texas Mexican, first of all, the his- history is so much longer. It's 15,000 years old in, in the indigenous history. And then secondly, the flavor profile mm-hmm. is different. Tex-Mex food is chiefly fried. That's the dominant technique. In Texas Mexican food, comida casera, thank you for using the term. In comida, in comida casera, uh, you have roasting, you have steaming. A lot of the food is steamed. Braising, we braise. And then you have uh, stovetop uh, stews like carne guisada. So the techniques that are used are, are very different. And I, say, I think the second dominant thing about the flavor profile is that we use chiles, chili peppers, not for heat primarily, but for flavor, uh, aroma, and visual vis- visual color. So uh, many of the recipes that we use, for example, chile con carne, we remove the seeds from the chiles in order to minimize the heat. If you, you don't get rid of it entirely because it's a wonderful, yeah. Oh, it tastes wonderful on the lip, doesn't it? When you have, <laughs> but you want to have a taste too. You don't want it to be all heat. But yes, you want to taste, so we minimize and we take out the seeds mm-hmm. so that the nuanced flavors of the chile flavors you combine in chile. My, mm-hmm. my tamales have two uh, chiles, uh, chile ancho and chile guajillo. And like many other recipes, we combine chiles in order to meld flavors that different chiles bring to it. They don't bring just heat. Heat is heat is there, of course, but we remove the seeds, as I say. So those would be two 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 interesting different flavor for profiles. The difference between Tex-Mex and Texas Mexican is the use of chiles, which is very different. And, and Tex, Tex-Mex relies on fry, frying mainly, whereas we do not. Where are some places where Houstonians could find the more traditional kind of tamales, the tamales that taste of that sort of chile? In my first book, Truly Texas Mexican, I include three recipes mm-hmm. for tamales. A pork, yeah. beef, and beans, which were the three traditional recipes that are known in this region. And uh, I found that when I went to different Houston restaurants, uh, these Alamo tamales uh-huh. really, really uh, uh, jumped out at me as being very delicious. And uh, actually, the family's from San Antonio, so <laughs> there's an interesting connection. When uh, when I visited the Alamo Tamales uh, in their uh-huh. menu, there they have like a like a uh, cafeteria style line that you can go through. They offered tamales that ha- are not peeled; they're still in the husk, and they have been charred over a griddle, oh. which we call a tamal. Uh-huh. And this gives you a roasted tamal. Oh wow! The outside husk is black and burned, and the inside uh, masa is crispy and roasted. Uh-huh. That's the way we used to uh, reheat the tamales in my home. And, and Alamo tamales does that, and you, it, they're delicious. Another one that makes absolutely wonderful tamales is uh, Sylvia's Enchilada Kitchen. Uh-huh. Actually, she, she does classes. She teaches classes on tamales. Sylvia Casares, yes. She's an excellent cook and teacher. Yes, yeah, Sil- Sylvia Casares. 
she's a great teacher. She knows tamales inside and out. As she says, I cook the recipes that my mother, my great mother, my grandmother, and my great grandmother taught me and my great aunts. Yeah. She is an example of the cooks today, the women who are cooking comida casera, whose ancestry goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Those are two very, very delicious tamales here in Houston. There are many more. Are you worried that this tradition of cooking is is disappearing? Thank you. I, I, I'm asked that a lot. I did a documentary feature film. It's a feature-length uh, documentary that was uh, premiered in theaters post-COVID. And in the final scene, a catering woman, Mexican-American woman, she says, as long as there are people who are passionate about this food, as I am teaching my children and my grandchildren to love, so long as there are people and cooks like us who are passionate about this food, it will never fade away. And and I really, I believe that. If you're in Texas, you're a Texan, and you share in Texas' ancient history of tamale making. All right. Thank you so much, Adan. This has been great. Thank you very much for having me. Happy holidays and happy tamale making. <laughs> That was Adan Medrano. His cookbooks are Truly Texas Mexican and Don't Count the Tortillas. You can stream the Truly Texas Mexican movie on Amazon Prime, Google Play, or Apple TV. Now, I am here with CityCast producer Carly on Jones. Carly, what else is going on around Houston today? Hey, Lisa. I got some good news. A compromise has been reached by Houston leaders in the I-45 expansion project. The agreement for the $10 billion project outlines plans to add in two managed lanes in the attempt to widen the freeway in each direction from downtown to Beltway 8. The project will commit to stormwater design changes and will include features that aim to encourage transit use and air monitoring in certain areas. The Texas Department of Transportation also will be increasing the money it will be paying to the Houston Housing Authority for relocation and development of affordable housing. Now, the agreement announced Monday does not remove the pause that the Federal Highway Administration placed on the project in March 2021, but it is likely that the hole will be lifted and work will proceed. All we need now is local, state, and federal elected officials to give their blessing, but it's great that we're one step closer. That is it for our show today. Tomorrow, the CityCast crew will be back talking about our favorite moments from the year 2022. We'll talk with you then. Um, it's called Truly Texas Mexican, and it's on Prime. Uh, I'm just screwed. Blech. All right, throw that out.